Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to what has probably been the most requested episode I've received so far. It might have a little bit to do with the fact that I was involved with the uh, original, actually more than involved, did the design of it. This car, I would have to tell you right from the beginning and knowing as much as probably anybody knows about the MC-12, I would have to say this has nothing, nothing to do with the MC-12. It's in a different league. Maserati C, stand, or MC stands for Maserati Corsa, and Corsa in Italian means racing, so I can imagine that this car eventually is going to involve or evolve into a, a more uh, performance variant in terms of what it looks like because here we talk about design we understand performance but i'd love to get more into the technical side of design because a lot of you are asking if i can actually explain more sort of an engineering approach to the design which is fantastic it's uh what designers do for starters the mc12 was destined to be a race car right from the get-go so my brief was to design a car that was strictly a race car and would, right out of the box, win a world championship on the track. And then we had to turn the notch down from 11, turn it back down a little bit and make something that was road legal. So we already started out with something that was a heavyweight, you know, it was a, it was a monster of a car. Whereas with the MC20, they've started out with something that needs to go to the gym to get to be a race car. And that's gonna probably require a bit of steroids you know, that kind of growth hormone stuff that makes you look bulked up and still have a ripped look, of course. That's a pity for me because I think a super sports car or a supercar should start out fairly extreme. I mean, you want to see that that car is what it is and you run the risk that they've gone in with, you know, a kind of a soft, soft approach a little bit. Nobody can critique this car and say that it, it looks terrible. It's an awful representation of a, of a super sports car. Far from it, it's a great looking car. I think this car, more than referencing the past, is probably gonna reference more what Maserati is doing in the future, that kind of take that they want their future hypercars to look like. In my opinion, this car is very clinical from a design point of view. It lacks what we call Italianita. It's lacking also a little bit on the emotional side of the design of what we interpret Italian design to be like, you know, this, this stuff. So I would say that the car overall needs at least one strong design element that you can reference, that you can say, okay, this leaves me a lasting impression of the vehicle. It doesn't have that lasting impression when you look at it in terms of one strong or even two, not too many, but you wanna have something that actually stands out and you carry away with you in your mind and say, yep, I'll always remember the MC20 for that. On the MC12, that was done in a few elements that are very characteristic. And one, for example, are the air vents on the bonnet of the MC12. You can remember these strakes. Well, the reason is because the MC12 had such large openings to get that much air out of it on the hood that we have to be aware that from a regulation point of view, a baby's head is not allowed to be able to go into a hole that big. If you hit a pedestrian, for example, we call it pedestrian impact, there's a measurement that's associated with the size of the hole that you're allowed to, to have on a hood. Another one obviously is the rear of the car. You get this feeling that the car just goes on forever and then suddenly it's hacked off at the back and you got this massive two meter wide rear spoiler on the back of it. And I didn't try to overload it with too many different design elements, but the ones that I did add to the car are very, very powerful, I think, in, in their expression. The uh, MC20, I think, lacks overall, at least, like I said, one element that makes your eyes pop out and recognize that car for what it is. It looks a little bit generic, I think it lacks a little bit of originality. Now that's not to say it's bad. Again, I wanna emphasize that the car is not a bad looking car. It's designed very well, but I would just, it needs salt and pepper. It needs some more spices to it. When they claim aero efficiency on this car, that a lot of the elements are on there for aero efficiency, I want to believe them. Obviously, you know, if you say you're doing something that's aero efficient, you expect the numbers, the affirmation, the confirmation that they have done it. But this car has a, a, an aero efficiency factor that is very high for, for what it seems that they're trying to achieve. 
If you know about aerodynamics, the coefficient of drag, the CD ratio on this car is 0.38. That is not a great number. Whether it's a thing of beauty or it's very generic, I think, you know, each of us have our own opinions. For me, it's beautiful, but it's still generic. So, you know, it's a combination of the two. The car has very few lines. You know, it's uh, very clean surfaces. It's smooth, it's chunky. The one thing you obviously notice right away, maybe if you're a Maserati guy, uh, you know about it, is the logo. So they've changed the logo, they've changed the Trident a little bit. Um, but that doesn't make a Maserati new. So when we come to the side intakes on a sports car and a supercar, side intakes are, you know, are the definition of the car. I mean, you probably wouldn't even realize they're there if you looked at the car from straight on side view. But having a mid-engine means you need to have a lot of flow of air coming in there. And they've managed to do it by putting the, the intake on the shoulder of the vehicle and digging downwards into the sculpted surface right there at the top of the fender. Again, they've chosen to make it subtle which is okay and another thing i find very interesting what they do, have done for for the drama because this car let's say it, it lacks drama immensely they've done very nicely a, a trick that does give the car active drama let's call it because what happens is you have this uh, hinging system on the doors what maserati decided to do is go with a system called butterfly hinged doors which is Scientifically, we call it dihedral doors or door opening system where the, the door opens kind of diagonally over the A pillar. And that's pretty dramatic. Um, you know, you got the butterfly doors that go way up and they kind of limit the, the height of a place where you can park in. Dihedral doors or butterfly hinge doors do that too, but, but they're a bit, bit more dramatic. They don't go up as high. Uh, I think they're cooler. They kind of work if you want to slow down very quickly. Just open your door and you'll get a massive air break. But what I find good about the car is there's no obvious wings on the car. There are no real, you know, uh, dramatic appendages on the car. And again, there's no aero visible. There's no real active aero visible on the vehicle unless you talk about the diffuser. I think a lot of the ground downforce on this car is done by work underneath the vehicle. So that is a very clean way of doing good aero efficiency, which is for me, slamming the car or keeping the car glued to the road. So you work a lot underneath the vehicle, make it less obvious. Because they don't have these wings or things doesn't give them an excuse to not add drama to the design. I have to emphasize that. And what, what Klaus, the head designer, Klaus Buza has had actually described the intention to be is they've taken what we call sort of an organic upper design and melded it or blended it with a very technical, highly technical lower design. So that's kind of like, you know, you're getting an Italian guy working on the top surface of the vehicle, the top half, and you're getting a very Germanic, very Nordic guy working on the bottom of the car, because in its face at the bottom is very Polestar-ish, if you know what I'm talking about. It kind of looks like from another company. So they've taken a very clean, very technical design underneath and mated it with a very Italian-esque, but not enough Italian-esque upper body to it. So there's a clash of, of almost two different types of personalities, two different types of, of, of characters to this vehicle. One element that is very important, I think on modern day Maseratis, because we have seen it in the past, are the three portholes, but um, they've kind of, left them on the door now in the way that it's covered up with a molding. So they're kind of there, but not there. So a bit too graphic, a bit too stylistic for me in that sense. It really doesn't look like it has a purpose. It's just recalling it from a, a sort of a graphic point of view. Now, if we start at the very front of the car, which often is the, the point of view that we first have when we look at a new car, the grill for me, represents Maserati when you look at it because it has a concave section to it. So a lot of the Maseratis have always had these, this instead of this protruding grill, it's actually a concave section. It goes inwards. If you look at the ribs, typically they're not, they're not coming outwards, they're not coming straight down, they're actually going inwards. And that really typifies a Maserati grill. Then the outside perimeter of the grill, there's no real relationship of that front grill to, to a lot of other Maseratis I've ever seen in the past. So it might be that they're moving in a slightly different direction. Certainly it doesn't look like an MC12 grill as I've heard. If you put the two side by side, you'll notice that there's not really a lot to do 
uh, in common with those two grills, except perhaps for the floating trident, the Neptuno trident from the statue of Neptune in their uh, Piazza Grande in the center of Bologna. Uh, the design obviously around that is clean and restrained. The headlights is very, you know, uh, their LED headlamps, which is a great stride ahead for Maserati and they're very purposefully designed. They have character when they're on, which is primordial. I think that's the right word. Uh, very important to have a light, light signature on the front and back of the vehicle. In the rear, I'm having a little bit of problem with the rear taillights on this Maserati because for me, they kind of look like they took the Gran Turismo tail lamps and they've sort of squashed them a little bit, uh, changed the proportions of them a little bit. And so it's kind of like, am I driving behind a Gran Turismo at night or what is this car? Whereas I think Maserati could have pulled the trick out of the bag by going back a little bit, not too far, back to the Maserati 3200 GT. Uh, which had the boomerang tail lamps. Uh, if you check it out, it's very distinctive. One of the first cars to come out with that type of rear, rear tail light graphic, which gave you immediately that, that, that knowledge that the car ahead is a, is a Maserati. That tail lamp that a lot of people love on the Maserati 3200, that boomerang style tail lamp. A lot of people never forgave Maserati for losing that feature and going to a very square, square-ish tail lamp on the modern 4200. I have to hold up my hand and tell you that it was me that was responsible for that, but not because it was my intention, but because when I recently arrived at Ferrari Maserati, the big boss put me on a mission to go to Jujaro. I was to meet with him and tell him that I didn't like the boomerang. It wasn't my choice. It was my boss uh, who said, you have to tell him that you don't like it and that you want him to change it. I never understood why, because I always remembered telling my boss, let's leave the names out here, that I loved it. And he says, no, you don't like them. And I couldn't understand why he was telling me I don't like them when I actually did. And he said, I want you to go to Turin, to Jujaro, and tell him you don't like them because you have to show him who's boss around here. And here's me, a young, you know, head of design, but still young uh, guy going up to the master of the, 20th century world of car design, Jujaro, and having to tell him that I didn't like what he'd done, which was actually a masterful piece of design, just to you know lift my leg in his corner and uh, and, and own own the the, the, the position. <laughs> he of course he was upset and uh, changed it, but not for the better. So I still agree and still believe that that boomerang graphic was 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 genius on his part. So. Uh, but I think that, that design could have worked very well on, on this car here to give it a little bit more character from the, from the rear. Now, if we look at the rear of the car, you know, it's nice. It's got Italian hips, the white, not super wide, but balanced wide hips. It's got a great double exhaust system on the back, that, that large diffuser, which looks always fantastic on a sports car. It's got a minimal, what we call a ducktail sort of spoiler lip on the back. So it's not just a straight off back and then comes down. It's got a little bit of a curvature upwards that, that gives you a hint of a spoiler in the back. I think if you want to add some drama to this car, keep that spoiler subtle, maybe in the first impression, but when it needs to go to work, when you're pushing that 200 mile an hour limit, right around 200 mile an hour limit, you want something to look like it's doing doing some work on the car, not just a, a lazy design that you know just stays there. So you want that that rear little lip perhaps to be active and to kind of come up or change angles to make sure that the back end stays down. I kind of like the trident motif that uh, you know in the back because it's got a mid engine. You got what's called heat soak. So if you're pulled up to a, a stop lamp or a, anywhere where the car is parked and still running, there's going to be a lot of heat evacuation from the engine bay. You could look through that probably a polycarbonate piece uh, and see the engine in there, which is very nice. But that heat has to come out, so you have to have some kind of vents. Now, if you recall. I don't know, the F40, Ferrari F40, very distinctive in the back with those kind of beautiful air vents back there. I mean, basic, but tons of character. I did it with the MC12 too. We didn't really care about what was behind us when we were in that car, so to heck with a rear piece of glass, we just put slots in the back. What MC20 has is basically the tri trident motif 
cut into that that polycarbonate area so it's an easy way to achieve a little bit of character it's not you know it's not a, you know i hope they get enough heat evacuation with that design but it's it's nice it's a nice feature nice little touch there what also i find really good about this car and I, it's kind of something i've always believed in is why do cars have to be a single color i've never understood that we've had beautiful cars in the history of car design that have been two-toned maybe even three-toned i can't recall any three tones but perhaps there are but at least two tones and what that does if done properly it can distribute the weight of the mass the proportion of the vehicle in a good way in other words no matter what color you buy the mc20 in you can get always or you always get the top in black and then the body becomes another color so what that does is kind of like slice off the top of the car and gives you a different weight balance uh, proportion on the vehicle. The top kind of looks like it's there, but it's not there. And your eye kind of focuses on the fuselage on the bottom of the vehicle. And that takes a lot of weight out of the design, kind of kind of emphasizes the body even more. So I, I like that little trick they've done there. The wheel design on this car kind of bugs me. The design of the wheels doesn't bug me. It's just that, again, very aggressive looking wheels. I, I don't know what other wheels are coming out on this car yet. It hasn't, uh, they haven't shown it. But the very aggressive design of the wheels versus the softer, blander almost design of the body kind of shock in a way that I don't think they relate too well to each other. Again, the wheels aren't badly designed. I can see immediately the, the trident motif in the wheels, albeit I would have probably emphasized if you look at the trident, spoke design that they have they have three of them and if you just single one of them out you'll see that it kind of looks like a trident but they've darkened the center spoke uh fork uh whatever you want to call that middle spline and it kind of loses the feel of a trident so i think just to emphasize maserati even more um uh, that that fork should have had a bit of you know uh obviousness to the middle fork they've darkened it so the two outer ones are visible the middle one isn't so visible but i think just to emphasize that it's a fork um uh, they could have emphasized the middle spork 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 spoon fork we shift over to the interior design of the vehicle first thing of course that uh, is my sort of um dislike i guess you'd say about modern interiors that are like this is the loss of the manualness i guess you could say of the interior design so i kind of prefer to actually feel like i'm a pilot that's you know manipulating and 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 and, and adjusting the interior uh the performance of the vehicle through the interior i want to hear clicks i want to feel things that rotate i want to feel like there's something happening if i push something and on this car, it's becoming, again, regretfully like the trend is, uh, very digital, okay? It's a new shift in uh, efficiency and effectiveness and all that, but the kind of feedback that you get from a analog or a manual type function is, is second to none. It's not to say that it's worse, it's just less input from the human side and the machine is responding better, the machine is more accurate, more precision and all that, but something, is lost the soul of the the soul of the product is is slipping away and uh we're becoming very similar i guess and that is leaving out one of the elements that makes you fall in love with with things is individuality and that strength of being able to do something uh, that allows you to identify a product simply by the little details electronics great all for it but they are diluting i think the the essence of what mechanical design is all about. So much in the same way that the MC12 had uh, a racing inspired interior, which was as minimalistic as could be, uh, not obviously to an extreme, but just putting everything right there for a driver focused environment. I think they've done that, managed to do that on a modern side or a futuristic way uh, for the MC20. Uh, I remember experimenting with many different materials uh, to give the inside, the interior uh, design of the MC-12 its own unique character. And I remember going on a search for a new material for the interior of the MC-12 and uh, went straight to Milan because of all the fashion industry being involved with uh, new materials there. I thought that would be a hotbed that I could uh, 
look at for research, for material research. And I remember visiting a few factories on the outskirts of Milan. I came to one uh, that when I mentioned I needed something pretty unique but satisfied these characteristics, they said, yes, we have, we have some material like that, but nobody really wants it because it's a bit too technical. And that's when I lit up, they rolled out this material that was almost a 3D type material fabric, uh, sort of a netting over a base layer. I mean, immediately I knew it would grip. And as long as it uh, breathed and didn't fade and didn't catch on fire, uh, we were on to winter. So uh, as soon as I saw it, I knew it probably wasn't the best fashion material, but it could really have a relevance. And I remember asking him if we could buy it. And obviously he said uh, yes. And we bought basically the Maserati bought. I didn't really have any money at the time. Maserati bought the whole roll of the, of, uh, and, and the material supplier, everything. They, they took it all in house and developed it. And if you look at the interior of the MC12, you'll see a very unique uh, material all over the vehicle, especially on the dash and the uh, seats. So that material was very unique and, uh, and uh, got a lot of press. Uh, and again, I think uh, MC20, the guys on the design team, color and materials, color and trim guys, uh, really went to town on the interior of the MC20 to make it look really spectacular. I like the graphics on it, the uniqueness of it, um, the direction they've taken to give it sort of a, a, its own look. You know, you don't confuse that interior with the fabric with anybody else in the industry. So I think that's a great direction for them to do. I'm anxious because I hope they don't go overboard on it, but if they can make a racing version of this vehicle, or at least a pumped up version, as long as it doesn't look like it's, uh, it's on the edge of death, you know, of going too far overboard, I think they can make something really, really spectacular out of the MC20. That bottom half of the car has to be more organic, I believe, uh, more in tune with the rest of the body. And at the same time, the rest of the body has to become more dramatic. At the moment, the car is a little bit on the plain vanilla side for me. We don't want normal anymore, especially if it's a super sports car. It's got to look like a super sports car. It's not a bad Maserati, it's just not a great Maserati. You know, I, I feel kind of like the MC20 is like kind of like my grandson because I kind of am responsible, I guess, as a father to the MC12. And, you know, if you're going to look at that car as something that you're proud of in your career and as a highlight, well, then you want the son of MC12 to be, you know, similar or at least a better version of it. I did say that it's not the successor to the MC12, yet I think if it's an MC, Maserati Corsa, it needs to start out looking like a race car tuned down or actually, you know, acceptable for road use if it's going to have that MC before it. The 20 doesn't really mean a lot to me. I mean, it's just the year. With the MC12, we ran it with a V12. That was pretty, pretty impressive. And uh, this car is a V6, so maybe it should have been called the MC6 instead of the MC20. It's not gone and trained at the gym like the MC12 has. This car has gone off and studied music. I don't know, it's a little bit more cultural. And I just have to look at the MC12 as like, okay, he didn't want to go to the gym. He went off and studied uh, the arts. But at the same time, you know, maybe he's going to evolve into a little bit more of an athletic route somewhere down the line. And that's the version that I would really love to see. I've said enough times that I love the design, uh, but I'm not thrilled with the design. So you can love something, but you don't have to be thrilled by it. Um, to be thrilled, you need a lot of wow factor uh, emotion when you, when, you, when you go for it. So, and I haven't thought about it, but I'm thinking about it now. Um, Probably, hmm, hmm, a seven, uh, let's be, let's be nice. I'll, I'll give it, should I? 7.5 max. I mean, probably a little bit lower, but I'm just feeling good today. So, because uh, I love Maserati. So I, I'll have to give it a 7.5 and just hope that when they do decide to make the MC an MC, a Maserati Corsa, that they do something to it in such a way that it doesn't just get tacked on, that it actually develops a shape out of the current chassis and current uh, 
design language into something that is more like a Maserati Corsa 20 could be. So that concludes my design analysis of the MC20. Thanks so much for watching. Please do let me know below your comments in the comment section. And I love reading all your suggestions of what cars to review. So please put down below what you think and what cars you would love me to review in the next episode. So thanks for watching and see you soon.